on July 30th, 2008. The incident happened in Canada that shook the nation. One doctor found it excusable and you'll find out why at the end of this video. It was something so disturbing that witnesses felt sick due to the graphic nature. On that day, 22-year-old Tim McLean boarded bus 1170 to return home to Winnipeg, Manitoba after finishing a temporary job as a carnival worker in Alberta. It was 12.01 p.m. when he took his window seat at the rear of the bus. It was a 23-hour bus ride, so he had brought his music and listened to it for a while. When at 6.55 p.m., the bus made a stop and picked up a few new passengers. One of them, a tall man in his 40s, wearing sunglasses with a shaved head. His name is Vince Lee. At first, Lee sat near the front of the bus, but after a rest stop, he moved to the back of the bus, sitting next to Tim McLean. After barely acknowledging Lee, Tim fell asleep with his head on the window panel while wearing his headphones. All of a sudden, according to some witnesses, Lee attacked McLean with a large knife and stabbed him in the neck and chest. Garnett Caton, a seismic driller who sat one row ahead of McLean, described hearing a blood curdling scream. I turned around, and the guy sitting right behind me was standing up, stabbing another guy with a Rambo knife right in the throat. Another passenger, Stephen Allison, stated that McLean fought his attacker, which gave the other passengers time to get off the bus. The bus driver and two other men tried to come to McLean's rescue, but they were chased away by Lee, who was slashing wildly with his knife. Lee decapitated McLean and displayed his severed head to the horrified passengers who had fled the bus and were gathering outside. They were in the middle of nowhere, so they could not escape anywhere. Katon reported that he got sick after he saw the severed head. Some people were puking and some people were crying and some were in shock. The attacker just looked at us and dropped the head on the ground, totally calm. A police officer who had arrived at the scene saw Lee cutting, sawing, and eating. After the bus driver's failed intervention, Lee had gone back to the body and continued to eat. What is even more surprising than the gruesome attack on McLean is the fact that police officers who had arrived at the scene did not do anything. They did not stop Lee. They allowed him to continue to desecrate Tim in plain view of the passengers. Lee would pace back and forth. He had body parts in his pockets and would hold them up for everyone to see. The bus driver had engaged the emergency mobilizer system to render the vehicle inoperable because Lee had tried to escape by driving the bus. So the bus had transformed itself into what could be called a theater, where the spectators outside could not help but view and, in a way, participate in a gruesome play. It was as if they were spectators to the street show. In this case, the spectators were puking, fainting, and crying. Some of the male passengers were growing very upset over the inaction of the police. They wanted to go in themselves to put a stop to the ongoing horror, but they were ordered to stay out of it. In fact, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police had received a report of a stabbing on a bus at 8.30 p.m. They arrived to find a bus driver and a truck driver armed with a crowbar and a hammer, trying to prevent Lee from escaping. By 9 p.m., the police summoned special negotiators in a heavily armed tactical unit. Lee was dangerous, but he only had a knife, and the cops had guns and outnumbered them. They stayed there and did nothing while Lee was eating and pacing around the bus. They started bringing the stranded passengers to the police department to be interviewed. The suspect declared that, I have to stay on the bus forever. The police didn't seem to be in a hurry to stop the carnage. Some of the passengers were growing more and more upset. By 1.30 a.m., the suspect tried to break a window to escape. They shot him with a taser twice and handcuffed him and put him in the back of a police car. 
Vince Lee was obviously mentally ill and was under the impression during the attack that he was chosen by God to save people from an alien. He had been hearing voices for a while and was obviously not sane enough to realize that he had schizophrenia. He immigrated to Canada in June 2001. He worked menial jobs and he worked at a church to support his wife. The pastor had no complaints against Lee except the language barrier. He didn't show anger issues but he was apparently hospitalized in 2004 after problems with the police. He worked as a forklift operator and his wife was a waitress and he showed no signs of trouble before he quit in 2005. He also worked at Walmart and was a newspaper delivery man in 2006. Four weeks before the murder, he was fired from Walmart for problems with other employees. Honestly, a storm was brewing in his mind. He said he had to go to Winnipeg for a job interview, and you already know what happened after that. But right before the murder, he boarded a Greyhound bus for Winnipeg on July 28th. On July 29th, he got off the bus in Erickson with three pieces of luggage and spent the night on a bench. According to a witness, he sat there all night staring into space. On July 30th, he sold his new computer to a teenager for $60. It was seized by the police and the boy received a new one for his honesty. Lee finally boarded the bus going to Winnipeg that was carrying McLean just before 6 p.m. And during the attack, witness Garnett Caton, he said that Lee was in a... He was pretty much in his own world, like he was in a trance. He didn't show any emotion. Not in rage, but more like a robot. When Lee appeared on charges of second-degree murder, the only words he uttered were a plea for someone to kill him. Because he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, Lee was found not criminally responsible. The psychiatrist testified that Lee performed the attack because God's voice told him to execute McLean. He was sent to the Selkirk Mental Health Center. He had not fully emerged from the psychotic phase at the time, but he was starting to realize what he had done. Chris Somerville, the CEO of the Schizophrenia Society of Canada, had regular meetings with Lee. He visited him once every two months after his stay. Somerville believes that there are two victims and two families who are victims of untreated and uncontrolled psychosis. Since 2012, Vince Lee has been granted temporary passes out of the health center while supervised by a nurse and a peace officer. To this day, Somerville says that there is little public understanding of the nature of schizophrenia and its treatment with medication. He says schizophrenia is treatable and recovery is possible. On February 10, 2017, the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board ordered Lee to be discharged, fully discharged. Lee was granted an absolute discharge and there would be no legal obligations or restrictions pertaining to Lee's independent living. Pretty much, he's free to go and free to kill again. was an attack so gruesome it must have seemed unreal. The horrible reality of what one passenger suffered is something witnesses will carry with them for a long time. The bus was on its way from Edmonton to Winnipeg. Just after Portage La Prairie, a passenger ran to the front yelling, stop, someone is being stabbed. We warn you, what happened next is very disturbing. Crystal Goldman Singh is on the highway where a murder investigation is now centered. Eric, people Crystal? People in Manitoba are in shock. They say they simply can't believe that such a horrible crime would take place right here along the Trans Canada Highway just west of Winnipeg. Passengers on board this Greyhound bus woke up to hair raising screams around 10 o'clock last night. What they saw, no one could have imagined. I thought it was a fist fight at first. The one guy was standing up and, you know, there was arms were flailing and stuff like that. And uh, But then I saw the guy had a big freaking Rambo knife, a uh, hunting knife, and it was covered in blood. And he was, he just kept going at the guy. It was like he was a robot, though. He... Garnet Caton was sitting just one seat ahead of the victim. He says the guy was asleep with headphones on during the attack. When they saw what happened, he and others tried to intervene, but it didn't work, and they had to flee the bus with the driver. And we watched him go back, return back to the victim, uh, 
we went around to the front of the bus to see what was going on, and uh, he, that's when he, he brought the head up, and, and he came right calmly right towards us with the knife in one hand and the head in the other. And the three of us were just standing there in shock, like, and he just calmly looked at us with sunglasses on, dropped the head in front of us like it was no big deal. The suspect did try to get away but couldn't start the bus. When RCMP arrived on the scene, the suspect could be seen at the front window of the bus. With one failed escape attempt, he tried another, smashing a window and jumping out. Police, however, grabbed him and took him into custody.